Welcome to Southgate. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, if you are joining in with us today, that you are connected with a local church. Uh, we hope and we pray that if you're in the North Grenville area, that you are connected to Southgate in a physical way, that you are coming out to services and you are joining in on the events that are happening in person. And if you're wondering how you can get connected to Southgate, some of those things, uh, we would just say that you could sign up for the email uh, that uh, goes out weekly as well. You can follow us on our socials and uh, check in on the website to see what is going on in person and in our community. And so uh, we want you to be connected in that way. And uh, if you want to participate in what we are doing by giving financially, that will be up on the screen. We hope and we pray that this service is a benefit to you and your walk with Jesus. Well, welcome back for week two of our series, Not Today, Satan, where we are saying enough is enough to Satan, uh, the adversary, the enemy uh, of God. And uh, I just want to begin this week by uh, kind of doing a bit of a recap here and talking about how we set the stage last week for uh, what we are going to discover about Satan and uh, his plans. And so one of the things that we were talking about is this idea that the Bible occasionally pulls back the curtains to what is sometimes called the unseen realm or the heavenly realms, or, uh, uh, you know, these are the things that, that, that we uh, see every once in a while in scripture. And so we were introduced to this idea of Elohim, spiritual beings, uh, kind of class of being. And uh, we actually see that God is an Elohim, a spiritual being. Uh, but there are also other created Elohim uh, we see angels, demon, cherubim, seraphim, and they all kind of have different roles. We didn't really have time to dig too deep into them. But one of the things that, that we talked about is that demons are these Elohim, these different classes of beings that are in rebellion against God. And they are actually led by one particular Elohim, which we often see referred to as the Satan or the enemy, the adversary, uh, the accuser. These are some of the senses of the word that we see in Hebrew called the Satan. And so as we've, we've set the stage and we've talked about these spiritual beings that are in rebellion against God, I want to take some time today to talk about how we can resist some of Satan's temptations. And I want to explore a template that we have been given uh, in how Jesus resisted Satan's temptations in the wilderness. Let's read the account that we are given in Matthew's gospel together here today. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point in the temple. 
If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Then the devil left him and the angels came to attend to him. So let's take a look at at each of these temptations and how they are unique to Jesus' specific situation. And so there's, there's a little bit of context here that we need to understand. These are temptations that are specific to Jesus, but at the heart of these temptations Uh, There are things that we can relate to in our lives today. There are temptations that we get as well that are similar. You know, one thing I would like to point out right away is that this whole scene is clearly meant to remind the Israelites of their wandering in the wilderness. It's the same stage. It's the same setup. It's the same setting. This is a twofold strategy by Matthew, uh, both to strengthen one of his main themes of his book, the idea that Jesus is a new Moses giving a new law. And, uh, and we, we don't have time to, to dive into all of that. But one of the other things that he's trying to do is to parallel Jesus' temptations in the wilderness with the temptations that the, that the Israelites faced. His responses to all of uh, these temptations, they come from scripture that is written about or during this wandering period for the Israelites. This second reason uh, that, that Matthew is using here, the relation between the temptations that Israel faced and the temptations that Jesus faced, Um, It's an important uh, point that he's trying to make here. It means that we are being given these temptations. We're being told this story as, uh, and its responses. It's, it's a template for us, a template that we can use in our lives. It's the Jesus response to the temptations that we receive So this gives us both the understanding of how Satan tempts us and how we can respond to him. Notice the first two temptations. They begin with, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, some commentators think that this is Satan's way of casting doubt over the idea. Uh, Satan's way of tempting Jesus to go like, maybe I'm not the son of God. Uh, That's one theory that commentators have, and there's a lot of people that would believe that. There are other commentators, and I would fall into this camp, that believe most likely, based on the temptations that follow, Satan is trying to insinuate that because Jesus is the son of God, it should come with its own set of perks that because you are the son of God, well, you've got all these these things at your disposal. And these are things that should and could be exploited. So let's take some time. There are three temptations that we see here of Jesus. Let's take some time to look at them all individually and see Jesus' response and how we can respond similarly to the temptations that are being given here. Temptation number one, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, we we need to remember uh, this 
the, the, the situation that is, that is happening here. We've already been told that Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus has had nothing. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I come home from a long day, you know, the snack of choice is not necessarily bread. I'm not like, oh, I could really use some bread right now. But I can tell you this, if I haven't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights, bread is going to be like the most delicious thing in the world. So the temptation is turn these stones into bread. Jesus is hungry. And we're told explicitly that this takes place after, after the 40 days. It's very, it's very clear from the context here. And what, what Satan is trying to do is he's trying to say, you're the son of God. You have the ability to do miraculous things. Use it for yourself. Once again, though, we actually understand the context that Satan is tempting Jesus to use miraculous power. He, he's alone in the wilderness or in the desert. And he's being tempted to use miraculous power. Now, here's the thing that we need to understand about miracles. And we don't have time to unpack all of it. But miracles were always meant to be a sign that point to God's goodness and power. If Jesus uses these powers simply to feed himself, he's only exploiting all of this for his own gain. See, that's the temptation that's at the core of what Satan is doing here. He's actually saying, he's like, why don't you just use these abilities to, to feed yourself, to take care of you? You know, you gotta, you gotta do your thing. You gotta, you gotta take care of yourself. And I'm not trying to to, uh, to, to push us away from self-care or anything like that. But what he's trying to do is he's, he's saying, you've got power at your disposal and you could use it to benefit yourself. Now, some of you might be saying, this has nothing to do with me. I've never once been tempted to turn a rock garden into a buffet. That's never been my temptation. That's never been something that I've had to deal with. Although you and I have not been gifted with the ability to create miraculous events out of nothing, although that's not our situation, we have been gifted with incredible abilities. I believe that all of us have, have talents and abilities. And the question we need to be asking ourselves is how do we use our gifts and abilities? The temptation we face is to hoard it all to ourselves. Mine. It's all mine. It belongs to me. When we have the ability to bless the church family, our larger community settings, and so on, but we would rather use these things for personal gain. That is the temptation that you and I face. Let's look at temptation number two. If you are the son of God, remember this is the, if you are the son of God, beginning again, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So the temptation here is once again, Satan is appealing to, he says, you're the son of God. He's not going to let you die like that. Throw yourself off the top of the temple here. And okay, you don't want to do a miracle out in the desert. I get that. That's fine. Whatever. But let's go to the temple in the, in the middle of the city. It's busy. Throw yourself off the temple and God will save you. Imagine the scene. Imagine how amazing it would be. How incredible it would be. What the temptation here for Jesus is to force God's hand into doing something that was never a part of the plan. Make him save you. 
And this is clear by Jesus' response. He actually quotes from a scene in Exodus 17, 7, where the Israelites were trying to force God's hand in something. So we see that that is the temptation here. And the temptation here of manipulating God, some of you might see the relevance already. Some of you may not. But the question we need to ask ourselves is, do we attempt to manipulate God? And the reality is, I, I think this is a temptation that, that every single person of faith experiences and very consistently without realizing it. The amount of times we try to manipulate God to fit our agenda and our goals and actions we take to try and force God's hand into serving the need, like our own personal needs. It's actually insane. It's crazy that we have the audacity. We have the audacity to go, I'm just going to go ahead and do it and we'll see what God does. We'll see how he reacts. Instead of taking the time to consider, to consider what God's desire for that situation might actually be. The fact that we, we don't even take the time to go, okay, what does God want us to do? Instead, we, we sit down and, and we talk about all these things. We've got our own plans. We've got our own desires. And we go, okay, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it. And if, you know, God wants it, he'll do this, that, or the other thing. We don't actually take the time to go, okay, God, is this what you want? It, is this the thing that we are supposed to do? Instead, we just assume that God's going to do something to, to save us in the end. And the reality is I say this with such emphasis. I say this with, with such gusto. It's because I know that I'm, I'm a guilty offender. I, I, I constantly think up these plans and then I, I just assume that, that, that God's going to take care of the situation. And the reality is, a lot of times he is, but am I, am I trying to force his hand Am I trying to, to do things out of line? Do I take time to consider these things? We just rush into everything. That's the temptation that is going on here. Temptation number three looks like this. All this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. And of course, the scene that we're talking about here is he takes Jesus up on top of a tall mountain. We don't know which mountain. We don't know how it happens. But what we do know is that he can see the splendor of all of the nations in front of him. And, and, and this, this is the, the temptation. Notice that the if statement is removed here. If you are the son of God. No longer is Satan trying to appeal to Jesus' position here as the Son of God. He's not trying to say, you know, as the Son of God, you have this power. You have this thing at your disposal. You, you could do this. You could behave this way. He's essentially saying, man, this whole being the Son of God business, it kind of seems pretty lame, Jesus. Like... You can't do this. You can't do that. Like, this seems pretty lame. And so he actually goes after something that it's very clear that God wants. God wants the nations. God, God, God wants the nations to serve and worship him because that is what we were created to do. But the reality is, as we had kind of set the stage before, God has disinherited the nations. He's, he has said to the nations, fine, you don't want me as your God. You can have all these other gods that are in rebellion. And Satan's actually saying, these nations, they're mine. And you can have them, Jesus. You can have them if you bow down to me. Join me in my rebellion. Join me. Come with me. That is the temptation that is being given over 
to Jesus in this moment. Join this cosmic rebellion that has taken place. See, the temptation here is to take back the nations to control and have domination over these lesser beings. To take back the nations without following through on the plan that's already been set in motion to bring the nations back to him. Take back the nations by worshiping Satan. Matthew will later address a core value that is clearly held by Jesus in this moment. He will say, what good is it if a man gains the whole world, gains all of the nations, but loses his soul, loses his identity, loses the things that he values? What good is it if you can gain the whole world and lose your soul? Matthew's close to his gospel is also very intentional, calling back to this moment. What does Jesus say after his death and resurrection? He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. See, Matthew is is saying that through the death and resurrection of Jesus, he has reclaimed the nations. But, but... It's not all finished yet. He says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Now go. He's actually delegating that authority again. He says, now go and make disciples of what? All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. See, in this moment, Jesus is tempted to gain the whole world, but lose his soul. Lose the things that actually make him who he is. And the the deal here is that he wants to partner with us. How incredible is that? How amazing is that? That Jesus will have the nations. They will belong to him. We read this in Philippians, that every knee will bow. But he won't have them by bowing down to Satan. He will have them by his loyal followers. You and I, disciples, making disciples. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves, the temptation that we need to face is this. Are we loyal to God and his plan? Or do we just want to win the nations at all costs? Are we willing to abandon our soul to gain it all? And the reality is we need to keep this in check because we as Christians, we do a lot of terrible things. To gain the world. We justify a lot of this stuff. And Jesus here says, I'm not willing to budge. I will have the nations, but it'll be on my terms. Now, this is just kind of a a fun aside here. But notice that up until verse 10, the devil is being called the devil. And in Greek, this is, this is the word diabolos. And now, Jesus' response to this temptation, he says, get away from me, Satan. And, and this is actually a Greek, Greekification is actually what the commentaries say, is it's a Greekification of the word Satan. Matthew actually uses two different words to identify this being that is tempting Jesus. And it's as if we get to this last temptation, this last temptation, and he says, you are the enemy, and you need to get out of here. The identification here seems to intensify the same way the temptations seem to intensify and crescendo here. And so what what Jesus is trying to say is, I I will not have the nations without the cross. And we're going to talk more about that next week. But this is again reiterated. 
There's this amazing moment with the disciples where, where Peter confesses, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the one that we have been waiting for. You are the one that's going to usher in God's kingdom. And Jesus says, yes, this is absolutely true. Peter, you are a rock and on you, I'm going to build my church. And then he says, now I got to go be crucified. And Peter says, no, never. That will never happen. And what does Jesus respond with? Get behind me, Satan. See, the enemy, the enemy is all about the nations at, you know, whatever, whatever plan, whatever, whatever cost. Jesus says, I will have the nations by revealing who I truly am, by going to the cross, by self-giving, self-sacrificing love. So uh, today, as we kind of move into some practical stuff, but it's, you know me, I can sometimes uh, be a little uh, out there with my practical steps. So we're actually going to just call it, how does he do it? You know, like when we see something amazing, we go, how does he do it? And we're going to call it our next steps-ish section. Uh, and so this is an opportunity for us to hopefully get some takeaways. What are the takeaways? from this message? What are, what are the things that we should be considering in our own lives? What are some things that we should maybe be doing in addition to what we are already doing? So we're going to start with number one here. The way that Jesus is able to resist Satan, the enemy here, is that he knows scripture. Every single temptation he answers with scripture and with a deep understanding of scripture. Right? He doesn't, just, he doesn't just pull a passage out of nowhere. It, 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 it's the passage and all of its context. But Jesus is brilliant here in his responses to Satan. And so I'm going to do a shameless plug. We run a class called Understanding the Bible. And I'm not going to tell you that I, I can give you all of the answers to what the Bible is and how we are to read it, and how we are to understand it. But I do think that it is an opportunity for us to go a little bit deeper in our understanding. So that's a class that we offer here. And I just want you to keep that in mind. When you see it coming up, maybe it's something you need to register for. There, shameless self-promotion over. It's a class I teach. I really like teaching it. It's a lot of fun. Um, and, and we see a lot of amazing things happen in it. Number two, number two, he knows who he is. He knows who he is. We see this very clearly, actually, in the third temptation. We see this very clearly in the third temptation. And so the thing that we can learn for ourselves is that self-discovery is not something to avoid. You know, we have things like Myers-Briggs tests. Uh, we've got the, um, the Enneagram stuff. And, and there's a lot of people that get really, like, anxious about this when really all that it is is it's identifying some of your strengths and weaknesses and how you operate what are the conditions that you work best in uh, a lot of people get really really worked up about this stuff and the reality is all it is is you're learning you're learning a little bit more about yourself and how you operate and the reality is Jesus knew he knew exactly who he was he knew exactly who he was and how he was going to operate in this world. And that's a huge part of why he was able to resist Satan. Sometimes the reason we can't resist Satan is because we don't even know the things that are going to set us off. We don't know the things that are going to harm us. And so Jesus understands this from his baptism. At his baptism, the heavens open up and God announces, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. See, the more we understand about ourselves, the less likely we will be to fall for Satan's deceit. And so the question that we need to ask is, do we know who we are? Or, or do we have some disillusionment about ourselves? See, temptations that we will always face around our identity is to believe a lie that puts us either above or below 
where we actually ought to consider ourselves. We say things like, or, or we hear a lie, like, you're better than them. They don't deserve that, but you do. Or, of course you're suffering, you deserve it. You are less than scum and, and deserve even less than that. Who could ever love you? See, when we don't know who we are, we will fall for all of these lies. We will fall for the lies that put us above other people. We will fall for the lies that put us to a place where we don't even think that the God who tells us he has loved us from eternity past on into eternity, we will convince ourselves he doesn't love us. And that, that can become so damaging. I've been, uh, I've been reading with my kids. I've been reading the Chronicles of Narnia. And uh, this is actually the first time I've read them. And uh, they're totally worth the hype. If you have not read the Chronicles of Narnia with your kids, or even just by yourself, highly recommend reading them. Um, but there have been moments where, because I understand the significance of what C.S. Lewis, the author, is trying to get at with certain characters, like the, the, the kind of figure that shows up like occasionally, he's actually not the main character of the story, but he shows up is Aslan, and he, he represents the kind of Jesus figure who had uh, given himself up and was resurrected to new life. Um, there, there's this, this, this character, and, and so uh, I understand some of the deeper meaning here, and I'm reading these, these children's stories to my kids, and I'm like bawling. <laughs> I'm like having these moments of realization of some deep, deep truths. And there's an incredible moment where, where Bratty Child, a character in the book named Eustace, he becomes a dragon. And, and, and the interesting thing about this is that he becomes a dragon because he falls asleep on dragon's gold thinking dragonish thoughts. That's what C.S. Lewis says. And he actually heavily hints at the idea that Eustace was always a dragon. He was always a dragon on the inside. Now the outside matched the inside. It was only when Eustace realized that he was a dragon that he was able to change. And he wasn't actually able to change on his own. He needed the help of Aslan to change. And it's this beautiful story about how when we really discover who we are, exactly who we are, faults and all, that then real transformation can happen. And I really believe that Satan does not want you to know exactly who you are. Because that's when Jesus can come in and transform us and change us and shape us into the beautiful creatures that he has always created us to be. And so Satan wants to keep us, you know, a moving target all over the place. And number three, he knows who to trust. Jesus knows who to trust. He's not going to bow down to Satan. He's not going to trust that plan, even though it gets him the thing that he's actually there for. He's there to reclaim the nations. But he knows who to trust with that plan. And here's the thing. When we talk about the word faith, in the Bible, many of us think that it's simply believing in something. Like, oh yeah, I believe in that thing. I believe that God exists. I believe that Jesus exists. I believe that he died, that he rose again, that it was somehow for me. I, I believe in those things. But what we need to understand here is that the word that is being used for faith there is much more complicated than just simple belief. It is meant to to have assigned to it the idea of loyalty and trust. It's not just that I believe or think that you exist, God. 
It's not only that do you exist, but I believe in that so much that I believe in your character so much that I will put my life in your hands. I will trust you. I will be loyal to you. This, this is what it means that we be people of faith, that we actually be people who trust God the way that Jesus trusted God. And I think many of us, if we're honest and we're taking an honest look at ourselves, we are satisfied or we are stuck with the, I believe that you exist. And I think that that might be enough. but I'm not going to put my life or my decisions in your hands. I'll do what I see fit. And this is where Satan creeps in. If we do not put our trust and loyalty in God, it's as if, it's as if we're closing the door on Satan. We're saying, I believe in you, God. I believe in all of these things. We're getting close to truth. And we say, but I'm still going to run my life my way. The door is left open a crack. And Satan will weasel his way in. See, what we are being asked to do is to pursue. And it is a lifetime pursuit. This isn't something that like today you're going to be like, nope, I completely trust now. And then like, there are going to be, there are going to be times of trouble. There are going to be tough times. This is a lifetime pursuit. This is something, and this is the reason why we do it in community, that we do it together. This is, this is something that won't be figured out overnight. But let's encourage each other to move towards God's peace, his presence, and his kingdom together. As we resist Satan and his lies and temptation, as we understand scripture as we understand ourselves and as we put our trust in God. So God, we thank you for this time that we have together. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given us a template that you have shown us how we can resist the enemy through Jesus. We pray God that you would give us strength and courage that you would give us hope And then ultimately, God, as we put our trust in you, we would see your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.